download and upload more than ever before with an ultra fast fiber connection. With three simple steps, you can be the one with an SLT fiber optic connection. Visit slt.lk. over the hurdle. The second reading of the 2019 budget passed in Parliament with a majority of 43 votes in favour. The opposition's hopes of defeating it goes in flames as several members of the SLFP were missing during the vote. Victorious hike. Soon after the passing of the second reading, the Finance Ministry takes steps to increase fuel prices. Confusion in the Alps. World Patriotic Lanka Forum submits petition against fresh resolution at the UNHRC on Sri Lanka. Human Rights High Commissioner say Sri Lanka already agreed to the resolution. A blanket ban. Boeing is in the hot waters once again with many countries joining the ban of its latest aircraft 737 MAX 8. UK joins Singapore and Australia in temporary suspension tonight, Tuesday, the 12th of March, 2019. From Adha Verana, this is Adha Verana First at Nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. A very good evening and welcome to First at Nine right here on Adha Verana 24. I'm Mahish Johnny all alone today. Uh, the budget seems to be the dominating topic today, so we got full coverage of the second reading. It is also our lead story. Now, the second reading of the budget for the remainder of 2019 was passed in Parliament today with a majority of 43 votes. The House passed the second reading of the budget with 119 votes in favour and 76 against. The UPFA and the JVP voted against the second reading of the budget while the TNA, UNP and Parliamentarian Arumugam Thonduban Muthusivalingam voted in favour. The third reading of the debate, also known as the Committee Stage Debate, will commence from tomorrow and the vote will be taken up on the 5th of April. The parliamentary debate on the 2019 budget concluded today following the presentation of the second reading of the budget on the 5th of this month by Minister of Finance Mangala Samravira. Following a meeting headed by opposition leader Mahindra Rajapaksha, the UPFA parliamentary group came to an agreement this morning to cast their vote against the budget. However, before the commencement of the vote on the second reading of the budget, UPFA parliamentarian Tilanga Sumitipala aired his views. Parts of the president's expenditure head will also be included in this budget. So it's difficult for us to abstain from casting our votes for the second reading. This is why we expect to abstain from voting for the budget today and then cast our vote in favour of president's expenditure head tomorrow. As the SLFP, we will then take a decision on principle for the third reading of the budget. Voting on the second reading of the budget commenced under the electronic voting system at around 5 p.m. today. 119 parliamentarians cast their vote in favour, while 76 cast their vote against the budget. Accordingly, the second reading of the budget for the remainder of 2019 was passed in parliament with the majority of 43 votes. The UMP, TNA and Sri Lanka Muslim Congress also cast their votes in favour of the budget. It was noteworthy, however, that parliamentarians of the Ceylon Workers' Congress, Armugam Thundaman, Muthu Sivalingam, who represent the opposition, also cast their votes in favour of the second reading of the budget. The JVP and UPFA cast their vote against the budget today. However, General Secretary of the UPFA, Mahinda Maravira, General Secretary of the SLFP, Dasiri Sekra, Parliamentarians Dr. Sara Tamulgama, S.P. Disanaika, Douglas Devananda, Venable Atulia Ratanathera, were not present in the House when the voting was underway. UMP Parliamentarians Ashoka Priyanta and Dr. Vijayadasa Rajapaksha, who supported the government of then Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksha in October, were also absent at the time. Meanwhile, the committee stage debate on the budget will commence from tomorrow until the 5th of April when the final vote on the budget is scheduled to take place. During the final debate on the second reading of the budget, parliamentarians representing the government as well as the opposition expressed varied views. 
I must say that we couldn't do much during the 19-day tenure of myself as the finance minister. We were not able to make any changes within the central bank and hence we weren't able to take measures to ensure the appreciation of the rupee. Therefore, if the central bank reserves have lost 1,000 million US dollars, the finance minister must accuse central bank officials appointed by this government. And there have been several heroic acts by the UNP's so-called economist. They incurred losses of 1,000 billion rupees for the country through the central bank bond scam. They were also responsible for the highest depreciation of the Sri Lankan rupee. They also entered into a free trade agreement with Singapore in spite of heavy criticism. They said they would pay back all Chinese loans with money they have got from selling off the Hambantota port. But they used this money only for the expenses of the state. This is enough now. We ask the help of the backbenchers to support us to get rid of the government that is harmful for this country. We kept on saying that Central Bank is responsible for the economic deadlock in the country. Recently, the government has taken a 3 billion US dollars loan with the interest of 7.85 percent. Two to three years ago, we could have taken the same loan with the interest rate less than 5 percent. I believe this is the final budget presented by the current government. This budget says that the government will again have to get a loan of over 2,200 billion rupees. Taking loans has become a business now. This government has issued five-year sovereign bonds for an interest rate of 6.85%, while the 10-year sovereign bond for an interest rate of 7.81%. The finance minister must today tell the parliament as to why would you issue these sovereign bonds with such high interest rates. It's clear that a major scam similar to the controversial bond scam has taken place here. The government will have to take loans amounting to heavy debts during this year as well. Those who create the debt mafia in the country are criticizing us. There was a finance minister during the 52-day tenor who came and sat on my seat forcibly. I don't know who writes these speeches for the opposition leader because it was filled with lies. It wasn't because we betrayed the country that we got the GSP plus concession. It was because we upheld democracy in the nation. Parliamentarian Andra Kumar says that we have to pay a higher interest rate even more than what Greece and Thailand pay for sovereign bonds. Because of the 52-day coup, we were downgraded on all international economic ratings. I should also mention that the highest number of private vehicles have been brought by the public during our tenor. But because there was a depreciation of the rupee, we had to implement a cash margin of 200%. But I'm happy to announce that cash margin was completely removed from last Friday. We also had to put limitations on vehicle permits. But since there is an appreciation of the rupee, we will start issuing permits for the retired from the 1st of May. Public servants will be allowed to import a victim from 1st June of this year. All good news to the government necessarily doesn't mean it's good news for you and me. Soon after the second reading of the budget was passed in Parliament, the Ministry of Finance announced that fuel prices have been increased with effect from midnight today based on the automatic fuel pricing formula. Now, it was due yesterday. The price of petrol has been increased by 3 rupees per litre, while the price of diesel has been hiked by 1 rupee per litre. The revised prices of fuel will come into effect midnight tonight. The price of a litre of diesel will increase by a rupee while a litre of petrol will increase by three rupees. You will get to know the prices of super diesel and octane 92 petrol via a gas at tonight, but diesel will increase by one rupee a litre. A committee appointed on fuel prices revised the prices of fuel monthly according to the prices of the global oil market and the fuel price formula. The price hike comes in a backdrop where oil rose to around 67 US dollars a barrel today. Brent crude, the global benchmark, rose by 57 cents to 67 US dollars and 15 cents a barrel, while US West Texas Intermediate crude added 47 cents to 57 US dollars and 26 cents. UPFA parliamentarian Dr. Bandala Gunavardhana warns that financial institutions will be at risk as soon as the budget is passed in parliament. Addressing a media briefing in Colombo today, the parliamentarian also said that the country has taken foreign loans on exorbitant interest rates. The government presented its budget for the year 2019 a few days back. They approached international markets last Thursday before the budget was passed and took a loan of US dollars 2.4 billion on an interest rate of 8%. 
Other countries usually take loans on a percentage of 3% or 4%, but we have taken a loan double the usual rate. When Mahindra Rajpaksa took over the country, the amount of unsettled debts was 2 trillion rupees and rose by 5 trillion rupees during his tenure. Within seven years, it increased to 12 trillion rupees. This government has done nothing. When the Prime Minister was questioned over new projects, he says 200 school buildings were constructed and the country was made self-sufficient with rice. As soon as the budget is passed, the country will face a huge financial crisis. <laughs> This budget proposed the increase of taxes. The government has to collect 2,409 billion rupees to address the budget deficit. They can't collect this amount from the tax money. They will have to go for foreign loans. This is an unsuccessful budget by an unsuccessful government. The government revenue for this year equals the amount of loan premiums and interest. The government is not in a position to carry out development projects any further. The country is trapped in a debt trap with no revenue coming in. <laughs> General Secretary of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, Dayasi Jayasekar, alleges that the Sri Lanka Freedom Party will vote against the proposed Counter-Terrorism Act, which is expected to replace the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Addressing a media briefing today, the former minister also charged that the new bill aims to bury the democratic rights in the country and that they will use their votes in parliament to defeat it. The government is attempting to control activities of civil societies, trade unions and media in the guise of replacing the Prevention of Terrorism Act with a new act. Disruption of essential services, damaging public property and trade union activities will be considered as terrorist activities. Clauses number 3.3 of the new bill speaks about disruption of health services. If the GMOA engages in a trade union action tomorrow, they can consider it as a threat to the health service and the government will name it as a terror act, so action can be taken against the GMOA. Clause number 10 of the bill refers to the media. An example for this is the revelation of the bond issue by the media. There is an effort to identify such investigative reporting as terror activities. We vehemently condemn this, we will take every measure possible to defeat this act. The World Patriotic Lankan Forum submitted a petition at the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights today against the fresh resolution to presented by the uh, core group on Sri Lanka headed by the UK. The Office of the Human Rights High Commissioner, however, informed the group that the particular resolution had already been co-sponsored by Sri Lanka with the signature of the permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations in Geneva, ALA Aziz. Now, following the revelation, the World Patriotic Lankan Forum called on President Maithripala Sirisena to immediately look into the matter and take necessary action, citing that the resolution has been co-sponsored without the knowledge of the government. The World Patriotic Lankan Forum today submitted a petition against the fresh resolution to be tabled by the core group on Sri Lanka at the ongoing 40th regular session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Accordingly, members of the forum submitted their petition to the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. It was during this occasion did they learn that the permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations in Geneva, ALA Aziz, had signed for the resolution two weeks ago. World Patriotic Sri Lankan Forum has visited the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner's Office to submit a petition against High Commissioner's annual report on Sri Lanka and to submit a letter expressing our disagreement over the fresh resolution prepared by United Kingdom, Germany and several other European countries. Shockingly, we got to know that fresh resolution prepared by United Kingdom has already been approved, co-sponsored and signed by the Sri Lankan permanent representative to Geneva, Mr. L. A. Aziz. As far as we know, he didn't get proper approval from the President and Cabinet of Sri Lanka to co-sponsor and sign such a serious document. B World Patriotic Sri Lankan Forum vehemently condemns this treacherous action and demand the President to take immediate actions. The members of the World Patriotic Lankan Forum had then requested that they be granted an opportunity to meet with Ambassador Aziz. However, the Office of the Permanent Representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations in Geneva had responded saying that a meeting with the Ambassador cannot be scheduled within these two days. Meanwhile, Chief Minister of the Northern Province, C. Vignesh Fern, expressed his views regarding the government's progress on the recommendations by the United Nations Human Rights Council. 
the government did not implement recommendations put forth by the United Nations for four years now. Those who are in top position say that they will not implement them at all. The government will consider dangerous murderers as national heroes, will never implement these recommendations. There is no point in giving them any more time for this. It was already made clear when they gave the highest ranking position in the army to Major General Shavendra Silva. We cannot expect the majority Sinhalese community to implement these recommendations when they consider war crimes to be heroic acts. In other local stories we have for you tonight, the petition filed against the appointment of Mahinda Rajapaksa as the Prime Minister and his Cabinet of Ministers has been withdrawn today. The attorney representing the petitioners informed the court of this decision when the petition was taken up before the Court of Appeal Judge Arjun Obisikara today. The petition was filed by 122 members of parliament from the United National Party, Tamil National Alliance, Janata Vimukti Peramuna, Sri Lanka Muslim Congress and All Ceylon Makkal Congress against Rajapaksa and his government's continuation in office after two no confident motions has been passed against it. The petition challenging the appointment of former Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa and his cabinet of ministers to their respective positions was filed last December. The Dutch media today reported that the Rijk Museum in Amsterdam is to commence talks with Sri Lanka about 1,000 pieces in its collection that may have been stolen and become part of the Dutch colonial heritage. The move comes after last week's decision by the Dutch National Museum of World Cultures to publish guidelines for countries to claim stolen art or arts that is of great cultural significance to a country. Director of the Rijk Museum, Taco de Bits, has said that the much delayed attempt to return these colonial heritage should have been done earlier and that talks with Sri Lanka in two weeks will center around the return of some 10 objects. They include a ruby encrusted cannon which was taken as booty for following a military campaign in 1765. The Reich Museum has around 4,000 colonial objects, not all of which were stolen. The sixth batch of devotees who won the opportunity to participate in the Dhammadiva Vandana religious pilgrimage organized by FM Berana and the Berana Media Network paid homage at the site where Siddhartha Bodhisattva practiced self-modification for six years. The site is presently known as Lugeshwara Mountain. The devotees will be taken to Rajagana, the old capital city of Magadha, Magadha Kingdom tomorrow on the sixth day of the tour. Business news is on the other side of this commercial break. Stay with first of night. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Other Therana 24. Welcome back everyone, now on to business news now. Governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami says that under the proposed amendments made to the Monterey Law Act, the CBSL will not be permitted to buy treasury bills in the primary market. Speaking at an event today, the governor noted that allowing the financial regulators to do so has brought about fiscal forbearance in the economy and has allowed the government to become undisciplined. Over the years, the main source of instability in the system has been the government's budgetary operation. So it's very encouraging that in an election year, the government has been able to produce a budget which is not as expansive as uh, in other election years. The primary balance has moved from a negative 2.9% of GDP in 2015 to a positive 0.6% of GDP last year, and the target for this year is 1.5. That is a very significant structural improvement in the government's budgetary operations, 
And one of the key recommendations that the central bank is making, which I hope the government will accept, is that this, under the amendments to the Monetary Law Act, the central bank will not be permitted to buy treasury bills in the primary market, i.e., it will not be allowed to monetize the fiscal deficit, which has been the main source of fiscal forbearance in the economy, and this is what has allowed government to be indisciplined, with their indiscipline, and then get the central bank to print money for them. Really, one has to emphasize that what we are really doing in terms of these are borrowings that we are undertaking and strengthening the architecture for debt management, etc., is to buy time. We are not solving the problem. The problem will only be solved if we increase our capacity to earn foreign exchange. That is the only way. This is a holding operation that you're seeing. What we are trying to do is to have good, sound macroeconomic fundamentals so that people will still have enough confidence to lend us the money to be able to roll over this massive debt obligation that we have. Speaking at the same forum, Director General of the Commission to investigate allegations of bribery and corruption, President's Counsel Salah Jayamana spoke on the National Action Plan for Combating Corruption in the country, which is to be launched next Monday. We are also being criticized why we are not sending people to jail. But most of the people who are on TV accusing each other, they do not know we can't just prosecute people. Why? We need hard evidence to prove cases beyond a reasonable doubt. With great difficulty, we conduct investigations. With great difficulty, we gather evidence. And that evidence must be admissible evidence in a court of law. When this government came into power in 2015, maybe that they wanted to eradicate bribery and corruption. Everyone wanted. Only in the year 2017, latter part, the cabinet of ministers realized we need a roadmap. Thereafter, being a small organization in the country, only 27 legal officers for 22 million people, we went across the country with regard to the national action plan. So then we are going to give a conflict of interest rules. In a nutshell, if you are a public servant or you are, if you are in the private sector, if you are dealing with a person with whom you have a financial or other kind of a relationship, you have to divulge to a senior officer. In other countries, offense would be, if you don't divulge, it becomes a criminal offense. Our country it has not so far happened. Fitch Ratings uh, Sri Lanka says that the agreement with IMF staff on the fifth review and extension of its program together with its recent budget targeting medium-term fiscal consolidation are steps towards restoring a policy certainly after the disruptions caused by political upheaval last year. Issuing a media communique recently, the ratings agency however said there remain risk to the government's fiscal projections which could rise if the approach of presidential election due by end of 2019 triggered renewed political tensions. A media communique issued by Fitch Ratings recently said that they downgraded Sri Lanka's sovereign rating to B from B+, plus on the 3rd of December to reflect heightened external refinancing risks, an uncertain policy outlook and the risk of a slowdown in fiscal consolidation following the political crisis which ensued in October last year. The communique further added that the government has reinforced its commitment to medium-term debt management strategy and expects the deficit and government debt ratios to continue declining. The rating agency, however, said that fiscal finances will remain a key weakness in Sri Lanka's credit profile. Furthermore, the communique noted that Sri Lanka's external liquidity position also remains weak as the sovereign's foreign currency denominated debt payments between 2019 and 2022 amount to 20.9 billion US dollars compared with foreign exchange reserves of just 6.2 billion US dollars at end January. Let's take you to the stock market now. The all share price index fell 0.59% to 5,646.78. Its lowest close since 9th of September in 2013. The benchmark stock index has fallen 1.63% last week, according to, uh, recording its third straight weekly fall. Now it declined 2.9% in February, its second straight monthly fall. The turnover was 390.6 million rupees, less than half of last year's daily average of 834 million rupees. Now here is Hiruni Pereira from First Capital Holdings with a full report. Today in the bond market, buying interest was witnessed on short-term maturities in the morning session. While subsequent to the bond auction, the overall yield curve shifted slightly upwards with moderate volumes. At the primary bond auction, five-year and ten-year bonds were accepted at, where average of 11.04% and 
11.35% respectively. Equity market continued to be in red for the third consecutive day with low volumes mainly dragged down by distilleries and sampath. A net foreign outflow was witnessed with moderate partic foreign participation. The rupee closed weaker at 178 rupees uh, and 70 to 90 cents per dollar compared to yesterday's close. The currency has climbed 2.2% so far this year as exporters converted dollars and foreign investors purchased government securities amidst stabilizing investor confidence after the country's repaid a $1 billion US, uh, US dollar sovereign bond in uh, mid-January. With that, let's now take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other currencies during the day today. Boeing seems to be getting hammered in the stock market as well. We'll have that uh, story after this short commercial break. Stay interested. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Other Therana 24. Welcome back everyone on to international news now. Now United Kingdom, Singapore and Australia became the latest nations to suspend Boeing 737 MAX aircraft today. The US plane maker Boeing is currently facing questions after the Ethiopian airline 737 crashed on Sunday which killed all 157 people on board. It was a second crash in five months involving a 737 MAX 8 and comparisons are being drawn with, a, with the Lion Air accident in Indonesia last October. China, Indonesia and Ethiopia grounded their Boeing uh, 737 MAX 8 fleets yesterday. Sunday's plane crash in Ethiopia which killed all 157 on board following another fatal crash of a 737 MAX jet in Indonesia five months ago has caused alarm in the international aviation industry and wiped billions of dollars off the market value of the world's biggest plane maker, Boeing. Safety experts say it is too early to speculate on what caused Sunday's crash or whether the two recent accidents are linked as most accidents are caused by a unique chain of events combining human and technical factors. The victims of the Ethiopian Airlines crash came from 33 nations and included 22 United Nations staff. Ethiopian Airlines Flight 320 came down in a field soon after takeoff from Addis Ababa, creating a fireball in a crater. It may be weeks or months before all the victims are identified. The United States has said it is safe to fly the planes and Boeing has said there is no need to issue a new guidance to operators of the aircraft based on the information it has so far. But Singapore and Australia's aviation authorities, following China, Indonesia and others, said temporary suspension of Boeing 737 MAX aircraft in and out of their airports was necessary during a safety review. According to industry publication Flight Global, nearly 40% of the in-service fleet of 371 Boeing 737 MAX jets globally is grounded in which includes 97 jets in biggest market China. Boeing shares fell 5% yesterday. Ethiopian Airlines, which has four other 737 MAX 8 jets, has grounded them as a precaution. GOL in Brazil temporarily suspended MAX 8 flights as did Argentina's State Airlines, Arilonia's Argentina's and Mexico's Aero Mexico. South Korean budget carrier East Star Jet said it will temporarily ground its two 737 MAX 8s from tomorrow to cooperate with the government's emergency safety inspections. Meanwhile, India's regulator ordered additional maintenance checks on 737 MAX 8 aircraft operating in the country and said a review found no significant concern. Vietnam state media reported the aviation regulator would not issue licenses to local airlines to operate the 737 MAX until the cause of the Ethiopian crash is determined. However, not all airlines have a negative view. 
Major airlines from North America to the Middle East kept flying the 737 MAX, though Canadian Transport Minister said he would not hesitate to take action once the cause of the crash is known. Southwest Airlines Co., which operates the largest fleet of 737 MAX 8, said it remained confident in the safety of all its Boeing planes, even as it fielded queries from customers. Sports now, middle order batsman Kushal Janit Pereira, who sustained an injury in his left hamstring while fielding during the third one international between Sri Lanka and South Africa at Kingsmead on Sunday, has been ruled out of the remainder of the tour. Now, Sri Lanka cricket issues issued a media release saying that he will not take further part in the South African series and no replacement will be sent. The fourth One Day International will take place in Port Elizabeth tomorrow. Meanwhile, South Africa have included Aidan Makram, JP Dumini and Hashim Amla in the squad for the last two One Day Internationals of the five match series against Sri Lanka. Well, that's first at nine for this Tuesday, the 12th of March, 2019. If you miss any of these stories tonight, please log on to our website, www.adadera.lk or follow us on our social media sites. Thanks for making us a part of your evening. I'm Mahesh Johnny. Good night.